Uh, I, I'm very proud that I'm not alone here now because I'm surrounded by some famous good surgeons uh, and they're also going to join us in the future in uh, Barrier Link. Completely on the left is Dr. Antonio Torres. Everybody knows Dr. Torres. He did an amazing work for bariatric surgery in the past. He was the president and also organized a fantastic congress. Then you have Dr. Peter Small. I know Peter for many, many years, but now recently, since you are more involved in the uh, in BioLink, I hope you know that we're gonna, you know, maybe even have a better. We have just yeah, but they come. We just started gently. So uh, anyway, but everybody may come. Thank you, Sancho. Uh, I'm here surrounded also on my right side, two people who are very necessary for sure, you know, for a barrier link. They all organized everything. Congratulations, anyway. Thank Hola. You. Good job. And good. So, uh, I would uh, advise to start with the first case. So, the, the issue is that all the cases that we're going to present are pre recorded. That's since five sessions that we do as well. Otherwise, with the uh, transmission worldwide, I have to say, frankly, we were disappointed. Although the technical assistance from people from Medtronic was always very well present, still there were a lot of handicaps. So that's the reason that since I think five sessions or six, we started to pre-record the cases. And there are some polls as well on each individual case. I mean, I think we have now four polls. And that we certainly can further discuss after the recording after the video recording of each individual case. So if it's okay for you, then we don't have too much delay. I would suggest to start with the first case by Dr. Talal Kewater from the King Salman Armored Forces in Saudi Arabia. Okay, thank you. Hello, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great opportunity discussing with you this interesting case, uh, just a sample when things go wrong in bariatric surgery. This is a 39 years old female patient who weighs 54 kilogram, height 171 centimeter. Current BMI is 18.5. This patient has no medical uh, uh, history. However, her surgical history is very long list. At 2012, this patient underwent sleeve gastrectomy at other center. BMI at that time was 36. After that procedure of two weeks, patient presented to our emergency department with history of abdominal pain, vomiting, and fever. The patient proved to have portal vein thrombosis, superior mesenteric artery thrombosis, and bowel gangrene. The patient was taken at that time for laparotomy, small bowel resection of almost 80 cm and primary anastomosis. This procedure was complicated with wound infection and pneumonia with sepsis. The patient was kept in the intensive care unit for almost two weeks and she was uh, finally discharged home in good general condition. In this uh, x-rays and CT scans we can see the uh, uh, the portal vein thrombosis some collection around the liver and we can see the dilatation or, or the thickening of the small bowel loop wall and the gas in the in the wall or nemostinalis here also and this x-ray showed the pneumonia while the patient in, was in ICU at that time. 2015, me and my, this patient reached to 26, and this patient really admired surgical procedures. So she underwent abdominoplasty, brachioplasty, mastoplasty, and eventually. At 2017, patient started to have progressive dysphagia, vomiting, and weight loss with the gastric pain. Diagnosed at, at, our, at other center with a stomach structure. In 2018, patient underwent three trials of uh, dilatation, endoscopic dilatation, using a calasia balloon. Last, unfortunately, last trial, 
complicated with injury, general injury, and perforation. The patient underwent in sepsis, patient had sepsis, and she was admitted to intensive care unit, and she was uh, hospitalized for six months. Finally, she was discharged in good general condition. At late 2019, this patient had BMI of 18.5, dysphagia, vomiting, and want to regain weight. Clinically, in general, patient looks well, very skinny, redundancy all over the body. Her labs showed hemoglobin 12.4, albumin 32, and uh, low vitamin level, vitamin D level, and normal rest of, of labs. So as preoperative assessment, endoscopy at our center showed narrowing at the, in the upper part of the stomach tube. The usual or adult size of endoscopy, endoscopy was not able to pass. So pediatric size endoscopy 9 millimeter uh, was uh, used and then passed uh, with biopsies uh, were taken from all over the, the stomach. Uh, according to the endoscopist, there are signs of GERD and esophagitis grade A. Histopathology came, came back as normal with negative H. pylori. So the patient was uh, sent to dietitian counseling, psychiatric consultations, anesthesia review, and the rest of, free of, of our uh, protocol uh, as preoperative assessment. The barium swallow of this patient showed dilatation of the esophagus and dilated pouch of the stomach with signs of stricture or narrowing at almost <clears throat> the about third of the stomach where we can see the uh, dilatation above and below. So, in summary, this patient, young, female, she had sleeve gastrectomy uh, seven years back, complicated wine, with, uh, with portal vein thrombosis, bowel ischemia, she had bowel, uh, bowel resection, she's query in short bowel syndrome, and she's currently has severe weight loss, stricture of the upper part of the stomach, with very poor quality of life. So the question was, what to do? Okay. Either nothing. Okay, we're gonna have another, 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 another. dilatation or stenting, or to go for surgery, or other options. So if it's surgical option, so what to do? Strictoplasty, gastro I mean gastro gastrostomy, or just wedge resection with, with gastro jejunostomy or gastro gastrostomy, Roanoi gastric bypass. Is the anastomosis going to heal or leak, considering that she had portal vein thrombosis? The query uh, ischemia at the level of the stomach. So the tissue, is it able to hold anastomosis? Is it able to to uh, to heal? That was a big a big question, a big dilemma. But yeah, we're gonna have a, a poll, a question, and we can ask it here to the audience. You know, can we go back to the question, and then we're gonna see what Dr. Talal. Uh, have done so you can vote let's let's raise the hand for the uh, upcoming answers doing nothing nothing is good but nothing okay one or two let's let's mark it two doing really nothing send them further to the shrink but but there are so there are some problems and nothing is nothing you know i mean then she will visit another center but okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, but this is the okay. But the, the, the other options are here: endoscopic balloon dilation. 
We have tried that before, though. Yeah, there are some. There are some. One, two. No, 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 yeah. Okay, that's good. Dr. Talal, there's a good question from the audience. Are there some arguments, but it's already quite long ago, that there is a recanalization of the portal vein? Can you hear us? Yeah. Yes, yes. According to the other, the, the last uh, duplex ultrasound, unfortunately, it's not included here. It showed, yes, recanalization of the portal vein. Yes, partial. How much power left? That's a question from Peter. I don't think you have any the assumption of what has been removed, but just one fact, although she has BMI 18 and a half, uh, albumin is still okay and she doesn't have diary. On that part, is that correct, Dr. Talal, that the malnutrition is, is certainly containable, no? The malnutrition is, is, is containable and the, uh, the, the patient has no diarrhea and the recent album is 32. In general, she's okay. Uh, the, the, the length of this resected bowel was 80 centimeters, uh, almost 30 centimeters from uh, uh, DJ, uh, and uh, primary anastomosis was done at that time, in 2007. Yeah. A question from, uh, from Dr. Angrizani, you know, do you have any measurement or do you have any estimate what is the volume of the stomach? Uh, because we can see on the upper GI, there is indeed a bit of herniation of the cranial part and then you have indeed that narrowing, quite proximal, but we don't have any estimate distally because in the suggestion doing a wet resection or doing a, a, a myotomy, whatever, it would be good to have some estimate of the stomach anyway. Do you have any other uh, investigation that you have done? No, no, we don't have the facility to do the volumetry. Volumetry, uh, yeah. We don't, we do, we do not do it. No. Okay, good, that's a, that's a fair answer. Last question because, okay, yes. <laughs> good, good question. Yeah. Very good question uh, from, from one of the colleagues here is that it's quite unusual that this stricture or whatever, this stenosis is happening so late after those calamities she got. Do you have any other uh, uh, possible causes or, or reasons why this happened? I think there could be a reason that the herniation could, which gradually could occur because if you see, I think that the proximal part anyway is inside the chest, but, but anyway, I cannot see any or I may not assume any other reasons. Are there any other reasons? It's certainly not achalasia because we see proximal still that, that dilated stomach. No, no, the, the, the upper part of the stomach of the pouch was in, in, the, in the abdomen actually. The uh, level of the, of, the, of the diaphragm, as I just mentioned it in the, in the photo with the line. So uh, I affected it actually this uh, study live, and unfortunately we don't have the facility to record it for you as live. But during the uh, swallowing uh, study, the, the pouch was dilated just uh, below the uh, the esophageal uh, 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 okay. or and uh, the, the stricture was clear. I believe uh, the stricture was from the beginning. And it was like kinking or, or something, uh, some sort of kinking or, yeah. at, or uh, adhesions at this level. But uh, it, it appears later where the patient lost weight and start to, to complain more and more. This is what I think that this problem, uh, true. Dr. Sharan is there also from Cairo. Hello, more than welcome. Now let's proceed just back again to the poll because we didn't answer quite uh, all those questions, just quickly. I mean, we have the endoscopic balloon di dilation. You have the endoscopic stenting, but I may assume that she's not such a fan of doing endoscopically something because there was some perforation in the past for the duodenum. But anyway, I think as a first approach, this is certainly a defendable option, I would say, because a reoperation is going to be tough. It is going to be tough. And then for the reoperation, strictoplasty, wet resection, gastrojejunostomy, Rui bypass, I, I think it's going to be depending on the local situation, I assume. So let's see what you have done, Dr. Talal. Otherwise, we're going to stick to one case today. That's not going to be enough. Okay. <laughs> but the patient insisted to go for surgery, and she was 
having a very poor quality of life, according to her description. So we encourage to go for exploration. The 24th of September 2019, this patient went for laparoscopic exploration at his lysis and a plan for Roanoi gastric bypass, if possible. So it was massive or dense adhesions. The isolysis was uh, taken over for almost four to five hours. Small bowel, the large bowel was stuck to the abdominal wall. Fortunately, after five hours of adhesiolysis, we were able to see the stomach and to proceed. We were lucky not to have any bowel injury during our, our dissection. The patient uh, has likely 300 <laughs> cc of blood loss during this procedure. This is the area of the previous scar, the lobotomy scar, with a small incisional hernia. Or the talon, of course. So we started to see the stomach unseparated from the loop of the liver. And this section of the stomach tube up to the hiatus. Now this is the area what we think that's the reason of the of the structure or the kinking. After further dissection, laterally and medially. That's the area what we think the dilated pouch. Now we inserted, we've inserted a 36 uh, French bougie. It was not able to proceed after this level. So the decision was made to, made, to make a new pouch above the scarring or the, the structure level where the tissue looks normal it was very tiny pouch just taking the consideration that the blood supply of this area is not proper we also dissected the structure area using black cartridge in both situations and then <clears throat> gastrojejunostomy was uh, made, uh, hands-on technique using BDS-20 uh, in continuous uh, manner in one layer. We try to not to bypass um, uh, as much as we can uh, large length of, uh, of, the, of the small bowel. 
he ended up with a 30 centimeter of biliary limb and 70 centimeter of elementary limb. Anticolic uh, technique. Then side to side, jejunogenostomy uh, was uh, made using linear stabler blue cartridge, 60 mm. Then we closed the mesentery gaps, the pterosome space, and we had rain. The total procedure time was seven and a half hours. Patient uh, lost almost 300 cc of blood and she was finally recovered well from anesthesia and she was discharged uh, to the to her regular room in the floor next morning patient uh, was doing well she started the clear fluid and she was kept for, in the hospital for four nights while she was starting progressively uh, the the uh, the diet <clears throat> drain was removed on day five and patient was discharged home in good general condition. The hemoglobin was stable all over the admission, and she did not need, she does not need, or she did not need uh, to have any uh, transfusions. One week uh, clinic follow up uh, sutures were removed, and the patient had no uh, complaints apart from uh, mild pain. After one month, the patient was doing uh, very well and she was feeling happy. Currently, almost uh, three months and she's uh, doing uh, well. Uh, she's uh, in general condition and she starts to gain uh, weight. Uh, thank you for listening and have a good night. Congratulations. Just as a summary, just to the, the panelists here, I mean, this, this is a brave, brave, uh, That's brave a surgery. I mean, That's four or five uh, hours Seven of, of uh, dissection on itself. Still, there is a gain to do it laparoscopically than open because I'm afraid if you go for bypass and you have to do a laparotomy, you don't see the structures as well. You still have that amplification factor of your scope, but, but this is very brave. It's, it's, I'm just, uh, I'm going to ask just uh, Rui and Sanchez joined us as well, you know, any, any remark, because this is, this is a really very difficult case. Happily, everything went well. My congratulations also for your manual suture. I just wouldn't close the mesial gaps after the surgery, you know, <laughs> that I would not do, because the risk of having any, any internal hernia will be zero in that case. But okay, yes, good. <laughs> Rui, yeah. Yeah. So the suggestion of Dr. Rui, he would probably opt it to put the stand, you know, for four weeks and then sort of in the second one. That would be probably also my suggestion anyway. And then could see how things are, are evolving afterwards. But anyway, you know, you did a great job, a brave job. And probably the patient was very reluctant to have any endoluminal treatment because he had got that perforation in the past. That could be an assumption. I don't know. Yes. Yes, yes, we faced a lot of difficulty to convince her to just go for diagnostic endoscopy oh, yeah. because she's, she's not, uh, she's afraid now and she's fed up of, of endoscopies because she underwent four times uh, of endoscopies and last time what was to, to be hospitalized for six months. So uh, this is number one. Number two, the stricture was, uh, was not able to buy the regular endoscope. So it was only pediatric endoscopy and this pediatric endoscopy will not be able to pass any stent over. So that's all the, the options we have discussed with Trovi. Nice summary, thank you. Any yeah. further, last, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Antonio? Yeah, no. Just one question. How uh, uh, did you treat the, the, the duodenum perforation? Perforation was uh, happened with uh, the colleague in other center, that like uh, one year back. And we did not come to that area during the, our procedure. So I left it just away. And uh, we have to dissect just uh, from the DGH, I mean, the uh, ligamentum and and go down. 
I did not even try to 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 go to explore yeah. that area. So, so you don't treat it. You do it conservatively. You don't have to reoperate the patient due to the duodenal perforation. In my question, it was done elsewhere. It was so they did. Ah. It was done elsewhere. Eh? You no no. It was done don't elsewhere. Information. There no information of that. Okay. Last question. Final question. Yes. There is a lot of interest of your case. Yeah. Yeah. The, Good question. Did you do some anatomical pathological examination of the resection, the, the restricted part of your stomach? Yes, yes. We sent we sent that for histopathology and it came back normal. As normal, normal stuff. Okay, good. At the last uh, question from the, the people of, from abroad. I can see that Dr. Zay joined us. The Sunderland team is there as well, although there's one guy from Sunderland at least here on my left side. Dr. Saram, okay, I can see. No further question. Let's proceed. I can see that Dr. Shah from uh, Pune, Mumbai, has also joined us. Okay. Next case, also from Dr. Talal. Good evening, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen. It's my great honor and great pleasure presenting to you this interesting case of unusual bowel obstruction one week after laparoscopic Rowan Y gastric bypass. This is a 34-year-old female patient, weighs 115 kilogram, with height 167, BMI 41.5. This patient has no previous medical or surgical history. However, she has some complaints about lower back pain and both knees pain. As a part of essential preoperative assessment, our GI endoscopy reported as normal with positive H. pylori in the histopathology uh, specimen and the eradication course was given to the patient. Lab, lab results, abdominal ultrasound were all within normal range. On 5th of February 2019, this patient went for an eventual or laparoscopic Rowan Y gastric bypass. The patient was discharged next morning of the procedure in a very good condition. This video showed the primary procedure. We used to do a tiny pouch using two cartridge of linear uh, stabler with bougie of 36 French. Then we do circular gastroenteroanastomosis using 25 mm with a blue cartridge. Then intro intro was done side to side using blue color cartridge. Then we used to close the small bowel mesenteric gaps using titanium clips. In one or two layers as necessary. We also used routinely to do the elimination stitch as the entrance of the elementary limb to the anastomosis site. That we believe reduced the risk of intussusception or kinking at the entrance of the anastomosis. Then we go to close the metallicin space and routine routinely in all patients in the same manner. Finally, we do a leak test using methylene blue and air, and it was negative in this patient.
After seven days of the procedure, the patient presented to the emergency department with history of abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting six hours prior to presentation. Patient generally looks well, a bit dehydrated with normal vital signs. Abdominal examination showed soft and lax abdomen with tenderness mainly in the left upper quadrant area, mild epigastric tenderness and fullness. There was no tachycardia and no fever. Lab results showed normal white blood count, normal hemoglobin, slightly elevated C-reactive protein 5.4, and the rest of the, of the laboratory works were all within normal limits. As essential assessment in the emergency department, X-rays were done chest abdomen in two views and all were reported unremarkable. So we decided to admit the patient for further assessment and observation for rehydration and she was kept in BO. A low molecular weight heparin was started and a plan was put for a CT scan. On the night of the admission, patient had recurrent attacks of vomiting and abdominal pain. So the on-call team decided to insert a nasogastric tube. It showed translocated, dark brown, smelly content, almost 600 ml. After that, oral contrast was started. CT scan was done and showed dilated loops of elementary limb with some sort of obstruction at the entrance of the efferent loop or the elementary limb to the anastomosis site. And the contrast stopped at that point. We know that the elementary limb dilated and went underneath the anastomosis site, causing the obstruction of the anastomosis. And the official report was showed no no evidence of, contra of contrast leak, query, query nematosis at the small bowel wall, and finally the anastomosis obstruction was the professional diagnosis. At the next step of the treatment, we were in between two choices, either to wait and see, or either to go for surgical exploration we decided to take the patient for laparoscopic exploration. Upon exploration, the gastroenteroanastomosis was normal. The elementary limb was dilated, edematous. Some adhesions around the anastomosis site. We noticed that the elementary limb was going to the anastomosis area. Further exploration showed the anastomosis, showed the elementary limb went through the anastomosis, underwent the, underneath the anastomosis site. It was kinked at just the entrance of the anastomosis and went through the tunnel between the alineation stitch and the closure of the mesentery gap. That was interesting because we do this closure routinely in all patients and we never had the same problem.
So the irrigation stitch and the mesentric gap closure cause the tunnel and the, the bowel, the, or the elementary uh, small bowel loops went through this tunnel, caused obstruction, pushing up the anastomosis and kinking with time caused obstruction further and further. And finally, we close this gap using 2-0 PDS in running manner. Next morning, the procedure, patient recovered well, no more pain or no, or no vomiting. Nasogastric tube showed only 35 ml clear yellowish fluid and it was removed. Oral intake was resumed and the patient was discharged home after two days of observation and in good condition. Six months of this exploration, the patient doing very well and has no complaints. Her weight dropped to 82 kilogram and BMI currently is 29.4. The percentage of excess weight loss was 73.3. Thank you for your listening and have a good night. Thank you, uh, Dr. Talal. Any comment from the panelists? Yeah, I, I'd like to comment, you know, the way of performing this kind of anastomosis, you know, that I think, you know, for performing, uh, you know, a very clear uh, a patent uh, anastomosis, you know, the, 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 the triple mechanical closure sometimes is going to be dangerous. My advice would be you have to be as expert as the sort of elements for performing this kind of anastomosis. I think you can close the hole much better manually uh, for being sure don't have this kind of problem I there. Even, you know, to do hemostasis and to shake the anastomosis after firing, to check inside, I think would be bad. That would be my advice. The, the suggestion is, is I think, from Dr. Uh, Torres, is, is, is a bit right, because you always have been trained as well to do the triple uh, closing system. Now we changed already one year, and we closed now this uh, entrantrostomy with a, a barbage stitch, uh, most of the time, a, but anyway from 14 centimeters, but it's true when you were just stapling on the, and it's, it's very nice that you had the initial video with you, when you were stapling the remaining opening, I had a bit the impression, I had the impression that it was a bit narrow, the elemental right. limb joining right. the, the anastomosis. And probably that could have been a bit the trigger why the, the, the loop, you know, because of a twist, you know, went inside. I don't know, it, it, because it's very uncommon to have an internal hernia at such an early stage, you could have an obstruction of all the clips you have placed, but that was not the case. It was indeed an hernia. But I think that the, the, the factor, the preceding factor, was probably a bit the too narrow closure of the entrance to me. I also had a bit that impression. And probably because you didn't undo your GG anastomosis, but now, you know, by making the more stitches, you know, you were stretching it probably more. And happily, you know, the recovery was good. But for the same Take, you know, you had to make a new anastomosis, I think, yeah. I agree. Dr. Yes. Talal, what is your comment on that? Actually, after, after this case, uh, I changed my uh, my technique, that now I'm, I'm closing both loops together. Uh, I'm, I'm stitching the both loops together, including the internal uh, our mesentric defect. Uh, and we close this uh, entrostomy uh, uh, hole with, uh, with the stitch. Manually, good, good idea. We also changed, all our team members changed as well since one year and a half. Now with the barber stitch goes very nice and you can nicely close it transversely instead of longitudinally. The way you close it with a stabling device longitudinally, we always have the more risk to narrow a bit just the entrance before the anastomosis. Good. Any comment from the, the, the colleagues from Mumbai, from Sunderland, from Dr. Topar? Dr. Zaid from Dubai. I've seen that Maria Solovieva is there as well in St. Petersburg. 
Yes, Maria is there. Any comments, Dr. No, Sarah? Okay, yes. Okay. Yeah, you, you unmute, you have to unmute. Unmute. Yeah. Unmute. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ha hello, Dr. Delmans. Hello, uh, everyone. Thanks for the very nice uh, uh, both presentations from uh, Dr. Talal. Um, actually, I have um, um, uh, an experience in, in that, and maybe it might be uh, um, a bit surprising for, for many surgeons that, um, like uh, four or five years ago, I have attended uh, a paper and seen the results of uh, um, a meta analysis study done by the University, University of New Jersey in um, American uh, College of Surgeons uh, about four or five years ago. And it stated that there was, they, they uh, did a study between two groups, one clo closing both defects, Patterson and Gigi Osmid defect after ruin y gastric bypass and the, the, the other one closes only Patterson space uh, uh, after the ruin y gastric bypass and they found no uh, difference in uh, internal hernias between the two groups. And um, I started to uh, do this uh, um, study myself. And since that period, over more than uh, 500 ruin y gastric uh, uh, bypass uh, patients, uh, um, I haven't seen anyone in the uh, uh, jejunostomy. I have seen only two in the Peterson space, uh, but I haven't seen in the uh, jejunostomy. And now routinely, I do not close the jejunostomy. And I haven't seen any uh, internal hernias through the jejunostomy. I know this is uh, maybe looks uh, a bit uh, against many uh, schools, but this this is uh, our experience and that this is what we do. Yeah, good comment anyway. The, the thing is that based on the literature, because we had an all session here regarding internal hernia and I had to look for that in detail as well. I mean, the vast majority of internal hernia are still at the, the mesial gap of the GG, if you really look in literature more carefully. Abbas Bassi and then and, and Elms. But anyway, that, that, that's a bit your intuitive feeling, but I still would advise to close both, you know, certainly for young female patients, you know, I mean, based on the study of Sternberg in the Lancet, you know, I, I really have to recommend to, to close both gaps now systematically. That's at least my advice. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, Dr. Zahran, it's up to you because I've seen that Barbara is not there. We're going to present your case now. It's going to be also interesting because we had all the session of the omegaloop gastric bypass. We have all fantastic results. Seemingly no problem, so it's going to be nice. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Very happy and honorable again to speak to our dear friends in Barrier Link. We always speak about complications. I find it very useful to speak about very early detected complications and think together. If our management plans will differ or not. So we have a case today of a 53, old, uh, 53 years old female of a BMI of 53. She's non-diabetic, hypertensive. She went extremely uneventful one anosmosis gastric bypass. Always we say about complications, it happened in a very straightforward uh, operations. Okay. The recovery was smooth. The patient was discharged home 24 hours later. After one week, the patient, uh, the, this patient was uh, really smart and we are happy about smart patients because they can notice uh, alarming signs very early. She had uh, a persistent umbilical left lumbar and deft hypochondrial uh, pain. Examination revealed um, normal pulse, temperature was uh, there were only there was only low grade fever. However, left hypochondrial tenderness and rebound, rebound tenderness was present, and the rebound tenderness uh, was really obvious. The labs showed leukocytosis and increased CRP. Of course, we rushed to CT, 
However, there was no gross leakage or collections with free flow of the contrast. Different cut doesn't show any leakage of the dye outside or intra-abdominal sizable collections. So we, the decision was going only to depend on the clinical findings, which are not crystal clear due to the normal pulse and only low grade fever. However, the respect of the general condition of the patient and the very obvious rebound tenderness didn't leave us think a lot. And the decision was uh, favoring laparoscopic exploration. We found a small amount of left subphrenic collections. Only this amount, uh, there were no any collections all over the abdomen with localized pyogenic membranes. The methylene blue test was done and there was obvious minor leak, which we think that it was in the first 24 hours. So, my friends, what do you think in this condition, if it were your case? Either to do a revision of the gastrojejunostomy, dismantle the anastomosis and restore continuity, convert into Roy gastric bypass with revision of the gastrojejunostomy, convert into Roy Y gastric bypass with revision of the gastrojejunostomy plus insertion of omega stent. Okay, we have a, a poll, I think. I'm going to ask also to the audience here and the, the panelists, you know, what would you opt for? What would you go? And, and I, I look to my completely left, Ruby Roubaix, who is, is a uh, famous uh, Omega. Can you come a bit closer to the microphone? Yeah. Okay. So, omega fan. <laughs> for, let's let's okay. otherwise, yes, okay. The, 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 my criteria, and I suppose most of our performers and technicians said, if the patient is a critical ill patient, there is a chance for uh, uh, serious complications or death, uh, it's better to revert to the normal anatomy. So, to, uh, and do the, the anastomosis and do a gastro gastrostomy, and uh, everything will go down. Okay. It will feel cool. If the patient is okay, is uh, uh, well balanced without any uh, special criteria, uh, the best solution, in, in my view, is I've seen it a, a time, uh, just, a, just a revision, just a closure of the hole. And it worked, but it was one case only, not in my hospital, in, a, in, another, in another hospital in Lisbon from another colleague. But uh, what is recommended is to, to repair, maybe revise the anatomy and the uh, an anastomosis and make a, a ruin wide diversion in order to remove the bile from that anastomosis. And in that way, it will heal quickly uh, the next week. What would you do, Peter? In that case, the patient is not critically ill. I mean, there is quite a lot of rebound tenderness and, and she's inflammatory, but she, she's still stable. Is that correct? Dr. Sharan, she was... Oh. Uh, you, yeah. Okay, she was stable and uh, she was not tachycardic and there was only low-grade fever. Yeah. So she was still um, uh, stable. Good. Peter? Uh, if Let's say you've done a ruin wire or what would you do with a leak at the joint? You'd stitch it up, you put a drain in and you'd wait. That's what I would do. Yeah. But it, it, yeah, it's, it's an omega loop now, so we would it also do in an omega Still loop. do it with that. Still do, yeah. Okay, let's, let's go to the audience and let's see what is the answer. Revision of the gastrojejunostomy, 23%. Dismantle the anastomosis and restore continuity, 8%. And convert to a bypass, the vast majority, 69 I'm just going to ask here now to the audience, who would opt for to the simple, the ample revision of the gastrojejunostomy? Raise your hands. I think it's just 10% or 15% from the, the audience here. Then dismantle the anastomosis and restore continuity. Nobody. 
I think this is correct. And Rory was mentioning that in the critically ill page, but that's going to be, it's not going to be necessary, I think, to do that, honestly, I mean. And then converting to a Rouai bypass with, with evidently the revision of, and the, the exclusion of the gastrogenostomy, who would opt for that? Yeah. I think it's, it, yeah, the, the majority is, is choosing for that uh, suggestion. With a mega stand, I don't think there's anybody who would choose for that because then, yeah, you're going to lean on, on, on two principles of healing. I think that one principle is going to be enough. Myself, I would, would revise the gastrogenostomy, but, but anyway, uh, let's see what you have done, Dr. Saran. We thought about the four options. Usually, in heavy leaks, when the whole abdomen is soiled, it's sometimes very risky to revise the anastomosis or at least to do a new anastomosis. And this decision is always controversial. The early detection of leak and having only localized and not generalized peritonitis helped us to take the decision. Number one, to revise the anastomosis, creating new gastrogenostomy Now we are closing the gastrogenostomy. And dividing the absent loop distal to the to, to the previous gastrogenostomy in order to perform gastrogenostomy and convert it into a row in Y gastric bypass. So that was the decision. The abdomen was okay. There was no much soiling. The intestine looks healthy. So we thought that doing uh, two new anastomoses is not a problem. And at the end, of course, we excised the remaining uh, bowel with the old gastrogenostomy. Now, since we uh, converted to Renoir gastric bypass, we had to close the Patterson defect. Testing the new gastrogenostomy seemed okay. And finally, extracting the old gastrogenostomy and the nearby inflamed bowel. We removed all the bowel um, having pyogenic membranes to make the new anastomosis in new uh, healthy um, uh, small intestines. So day one, post-operative, uh, the vitals was normal in regards of pulse and <coughs> pressure. She was off fever. The drain only gets a small serosanguinous discharge. She was still in PO. However, the TLC and CRP wa were still up. Much improvement, and there was also uh, still some abdominal pain in the first day. Uh, in day two, much improvement happened. The pain was minimal, tolerating oral fluids. The drain was minimal. The TLC and CRP went down finally. The follow-up um, after three days uh, of the patient, the, the, she was pain-free and the drain was removed and the patient was discharged home. Her two-month uh, follow-up showed uh, unremarkable findings except some wound infection in the early post-operative uh, follow-up and responded very well to wound care and medical treatment. So we, we chose to arouse or emphasize on two points. Number one, emphasizing that the local examination only with no or weak general clinical 
and also negative radiological findings is still favoring surgical option, which means that we have to respect only local examination, even if other signs are negative. Very early detection of leak after one and smooth gastric bypass can change our surgical management and improve our prognosis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very nice case, Dr. Saran. I think that you, you, you opted for the, the most you know, sure option, I think, to go for the bypass. And, and indeed, although you're going to make now two anastomoses in that contaminated field, but, but back again in, in the healthy patients, relatively young, I, I don't think it's going to you know, have any influence on the recovery of your patient, what you have shown. Okay, I think we can proceed to the next case. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Barbara is, is in our hospital. Can we go to Bruges? Because Barbara has arrived. Barbara is one of my, our ex-residents. I think, Antonio, you know Barbara the fourth as Absolutely. well. She was one on your meetings. And she's going to present a pre-operative case, not an operative case. So what would you offer in that case, I think? And I would like to present a pre-operative case regarding a recurrent and invalidating hiatal hernia in an obese woman. It concerns a 73-year-old female with inner medical history diverticulitis in 2014, diagnosis of polymyalgia rheumatica in 2018, for which thyroid stress is Known with asthma COPD, hypercholesterolemia, a multinodular stroma, and osteopenia. And several pneumonia. In the surgical history, we can rehold knee surgery, a laparoscopic innocent fund application in 2000 for a hiatal hernia with Barrett esophagus. 2003, an open hiatal hernia without neck was carried out for recurrence. She had no previous bariatric surgery. Her BMI is 32.7 km per square meter. Patient had a reflux problem for a very long time. Despite her two previous hiatal hernia repair and nascent in 2000 and 2003. In fact, she was never symptom free. She complained of nausea, dyspepsia and sometimes dysphagia, depending on what she eats. She has no acid reflux, but it is a food that regurgitates into the esophagus. Although the head of the bed is tilted up, she aspirates during the night. She has a bad odor bread. She takes a proton pump inhibitor 20 mg once daily, and with a higher dose she experiences no additional effect. Since 2010, she had recurrent aspiration pneumonia. Several preoperative examinations were performed, starting with the gastroscopy. The procedure itself was difficult. There, were no, there, was, there is a normal esophagus and a Z-line at 35 cm. There is a big hernia with foot remnants and a narrow passage to the remaining stomach. Manometry shows a normal esophageal peristalsis and a normal relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. The esophageal length is 18 cm, measured between the upper and lower esophageal sphincter. The mean length of a normal esophageal esophagus is usual 23 cm. It concerns the esophageal gastric junction type 3B which means that there is more than three centimeters separation between, between the superimposed lower esophageal sphincter and the crural, crural diaphragm. Finally, a barium swallow was performed. The wrap of the fundus and also the fundus is migrated intertrosically. There is a fluid passage of contrast through the lower esophageal sphincter to the hernia the herniated part of the stomach. There is delayed emptying of the hernia to the remaining stomach. The reflex of contrast 
from the hernia to the distal part of the esophagus when coughing in prone position. The esophagus is measured at 18 cm, corresponding to a brachyesophagus. We can conclude that patients had a third hiatal hernia after laparoscopic missing from the application and open primary repair of a hiatal hernia. Patients had a problem on one hand of significant reflux of food and on the other hand of recurrent aspiration pneumonia. Manometry and barium swallow have arguments for brachyesophagus. Patient belongs to the obesity group with a BMI of 32.7 kg per square meter and without comorbidities. So my question is, what are the surgical options? For lengthening the esophagus, a colus gastroplasty should be performed. But is it feasible by laparoscopic access after previous open hiatal hernia repair and previous missing from duplication? Do we need to carry out straight away a left thoracotomy to mobilize the entire, entire esophagus and execute a colus belsi procedure? Or is a gastric bypass a good alternative option as it is feasible by a laparoscopy and as it induces less reflux due to the smaller gastric pouch? But what are the clinical consequences in case of an intra intrathoracic pouch migration and also as her BMI is only 33 kg per square meter patient is very concerned about excessive weight loss as this is not her initial request thank you very much very nice case Barbara nice case. and not operated yet which is I think interesting so we go back to the, the audience here. I can see Maria is there and, and everybody. Dr. Zaid, but also here, Dr. Yeah, every colleague here. It, it's a difficult situation. I think the, the, main, the main problem is back again, back again, a recurrence of the herniation. That's what we see on the upper GI. You didn't do a CT scan. I think that a CT scan between chest and the... Uh, the abdomen would show a bit better, but I'm a bit afraid that that Nissen wrap, which is more redundant volume, has herniated inside a closed cura and would cause more problems. And so I, I, I really think that if she has aspiration pneumonia, as you wrote down there, a surgical solution will become necessary. That, that's, totally. So a conservative treatment option, forget it. Although she's 73 years old and she has a BMI of just 32, I, I just ask it to the audience and everybody is, is listening. What would you offer, Dr. Torres? I have my opinion, Barbara. Congratulations. And hello. How are you? Barbara, well, can you unmute? Can you hear me? But, yeah. I'm saying hello. Yeah. Okay. My option would be uh, thoracos thoracotomy colis belsi. Yeah. I think, you know, this patient is 73. Years old, you know the margin. The main aim of the station is to measure to improve its symptoms. Yeah. They are not getting, you know, obesity anymore. So the three with quality of life is very poor. I think you call it very safe. Standing for this. I think it's hundred percent right what Dr. Torres is saying. But who of us are surgeons? Even even experienced thoracic surgeons are, are doing a Belsi Mark IV or of I mean, there are not a lot of surgeons anymore because it, it has all been you know abandoned more or less and going for Nissen to pay and Dor. So you have to find a good surgeon to do that procedure. We do, we do. <laughs> yeah, we do. you do still. Yeah, okay, do, then yeah. then you can straight away go to Madrid, Barbara. Do, you do, can do, visit do. Dr. Torres. I think I it's do. a good this plan. Is, go this to is Madrid. What I am saying, you know, no. the best result we are having with those re recurrent. Uh, laparoscopy and laparotomy, yeah. uh, GI problem. Yeah. You go to the red thorax, you know, the, the surgical field is completely new. You open the, the, the phrenic, the, the, you know, the, the hiatus, and you know, everything comes up because it's back again. This all ray back up, back up. Uh, you know, they are in the thorax. All the anatomy, you know, are there. It's very easy. You put a B, 
you put a stapler, you do a different lubrication, not too tight. This is the reason I'm saying vegetable four, not no listen procedure because you're adding more dysphagia. You have to treat the, the patient with dysphagia and resuscitation. So in this kind of patient, in my opinion, your first aim is going to be to solve the, the patient's personal experience and opinion, the way of dealing with that. Uh, I was training thoracic surgery the, yeah. you know, for five years, uh -huh. and I do a lot of thoracic surgery. But it had a lot of experience with this one. I, I think it, it's, I'm just going to first leave room. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting because I had the case exactly like that. Is one. your microphone not working, Ruby? I think yeah. it, it's yeah. a homeopathic one. No, no. no. <laughs> I think that they had a case like exactly like that, and, it was with a, and he wrote a mesh to the esophagus. And I asked help to Antonio. Yeah, and I remember. He, yes, <laughs> and he very friendly he offered himself to go up to Lisbon and to operate together with me with that solution also. Same case, but uh, because I, I, I understand also that uh, uh, thoracotomy in a 76 years old woman is not innocent. Okay, there are some risks about that. I tried be, uh, before uh, by laparoscopy. Because I had before and do half a dozen of Nissan's, so it's difficult, but you can manage it. And sometimes the short is off because it's not <coughs> short tool. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we can get, we we can get the, the, the Nissan valve uh, or the, the slip Nissan down. And uh, if the, that is the case, I suppose the best solution is the bypass for the lady yeah. that is obese, and it is the, the best way of reducing the chance of the recurrence to get thinner. Yeah, afterwards. that that if it that, is feasible. Yeah, of course. no, but that is what I, uh, that's what, what also I would opt for that solution. But I had one major problem of a back again recurrence with the bypass inside. The chest. The only thing is that you can dismantle everything because leave that Nissan, etc. Sure, 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 sure. Because the bypass is a very good anti reflux procedure, you're yeah. going to be safe regarding the reflux. But that hernia repair back again with that negative intratoracal pressure, you know, it's always going to invite you back again. And we had some dreadful case, honestly said. So I'm not such a fan anymore to, to straightforward go for a bypass. Another comment, Bruno, you know, for being, you know, for, for dissecting everything after laparoscopy and laparotomy, oh, yeah. you, have to have, you have to have as a skillful surgeon as Rui and you. Not everyone can dismantle all these things without Hurting. doing any damage. Yeah, yeah. So when you are there, it's a, night, it's a nightmare, trust me. You are there, you don't know the liver there, stuck there, breathing, you know, like another ghost, put your ghost, increase the pressure, uh, help me, uh, my God, what I'm doing here, two hours, one and a half, three. Yeah. Barbara, you know, I, I would invite Dr. Torres, it's a long time ago <laughs> that you have seen him, you and then he comes to Ghent, you know, to do the operation. Why not, you know, I mean, that's going to be a good opportunity. Barbara, your final comment? More than welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I invite uh, you in uh, Ghent. That's going to be something <laughs> fantastic. Great. And Thank you. Now we go to, to Sunderland, uh, uh, because it's very nice that the team from Peter, uh, as well as from Will, yeah, yeah. Okay, they made it, so we're going to go now to Sunderland to have another, I think, nice uh, case, small bowel obstruction, secondary to a peck. Yeah, okay. Good evening, everybody. My name is Michael Courtney, surgical trainee currently based at Sunderland Royal Hospital. I'm accompanied by Mr. Will Carr, consultant bariatric surgeon at Sunderland, and who performed this case. He is also responsible for the long term management of this patient. The purpose of this presentation is twofold. Firstly, we aim to describe the management of a patient presenting with small bowel obstruction secondary to a peg in the gastric remnant following a Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. Secondly, following review of the case, we would like to get your view on the potential management options moving forwards. This case is of a 42-year-old female whose only past medical history was depression. She initially underwent Roux-en-Y gastric bypass approximately three and a half years ago with an initial weight of 111 kilograms and BMI of 40. As with all patients in Sunderland, she underwent extensive preoperative workup, including attendance of the seminar and educational sessions, psychological and dietetic assessment, 
and discussion at a multidisciplinary team meeting. Although the operation was technically straightforward, she was troubled immediately post-operatively with excessive nausea and vomiting. She underwent a barium swallow, which was normal. She was eventually discharged four days post-operatively, which is approximately twice the expected length of stay. Following discharge, she continued to have problems with significant nausea and abdominal pain. This resulted in multiple clinic attendances and recurrent hospital admissions. She was also losing much more weight than expected and had already lost 100% of her excess body weight six months post-operatively. It was initially thought that her excess nausea may be the result of a small hiatus hernia, and so she underwent laparoscopy and repair of that. symptoms persisted, and so it was decided to revise the JJ anastomosis. This involved excision of the current anastomosis, then the creation of two further JJ anastomoses, the proximal one to refashion the elementary limb, and a second one slightly more distally to anastomose the BP limb onto the jejunum. Following this, she continued with severe abdominal pain. During her initial workup, an ultrasound scan was performed and was reported as normal. However, on subsequent imaging, biliary studs was noted, so it was decided to perform a cholecystectomy. At the time of this laparoscopy, the hernia spaces were also inspected, and although no hernia was encountered, these were resutured to prevent any further problems. Finally, due to ongoing weight loss and nutritional issues, the decision was made to insert a laparoscopically assisted peg tube into the gastric remnant. Although this was inserted for feeding purposes, it was interesting to observe that some of her symptoms were relieved by allowing this peg to vent. As you'd imagine, her case was discussed several times at the multidisciplinary team meeting, and the consensus was that the only real solution was reversal of a gastric bypass. She, however, adamantly refused to consider this. Now comes the emergency admission, which is the subject of this presentation. In September of this year, which is approximately three and a half years following her initial gastric bypass, she presented to the hospital with severe abdominal pain and retching. It was felt that she may be obstructed, and so she was resuscitated, a peg tube was put onto free drainage, and an urgent CT scan was performed. So as you can see from this CT image, she did have small bowel obstruction. This involved both the elementary and BP limbs. You may note on this slice, that the gastric remnant is in fact collapsed, but this is explained by the peg tube being on free drainage. After the obstruction was confirmed on scan, she was consented and taken for a diagnostic laparoscopy. This video shows the initial findings of laparoscopy. As you can see, there are multiple dilated bowel loops in both the upper and lower abdomen. All of the visible bowel seems viable. And there's no free fluid posts or blood. Here, you can clearly see where the gastric remnant is adherent to the anterior abdominal wall where the peg is being fashioned. There is a large amount of small bowel which is herniated, superior to this peg, and caused obstruction. The small bowel is gradually reduced and inspected along the way. It all appears viable, and you may notice that both JJ and astomoses are within the herniated bowel loops.
the approachable bar was inspected from IC junction to GJ anastomosis and DJ flexion. Pieces were inspected and were found to be adequately closed. Whilst both small bowel anastomoses appeared intact, we didn't know whether they were unusually dilated. The gastric remnant was then divided for, from the anterior abdominal wall using a signet tri stapler. Rosa left adherent to the anterior abdominal wall, was then excised. Hemostasis was confirmed, the final laparoscopy performed, and the case was finished. The patient made a complicated recovery from this procedure. However, of issues with abdominal pain reduced oral intake. This resulted in further weight loss and concern regarding her nutritional status. Furthermore, since she no longer had a peg, the only option for enteral feeding was a nasogeginal tube, which she did not tolerate well, and therefore was not an option for long-term feeding. This complex situation was discussed several times at our multidisciplinary team meeting. It was decided that there were essentially two options. The first option, which was preferable, was reversal of the Rouen white gastric bypass. The patient continued to refuse this. The second option of a gastrogastric fistula but leaving the small bowel bypass in place. This is what the patient opted for. So during the same admission as her emergency operation she underwent laparoscopic formation of a gastrogastric fistula. This was performed by creating a gastrotomy in the pouch and a second gastrotomy in the gastric remnant and forming an anastomosis with a linear tri staple over the TAN45 cartridge. The gastrotomy was then oversewn with a continuous 2 ovicral. Pleased to say that following creation of this fistula, there was a significant improvement in her pain and nausea. Her oral intake significantly improved and she began to gain weight. She was discharged approximately a week later. She's currently awaiting outpatient clinic room. And now we'd like to look ahead to the future. The patient has made it very clear that she would not proceed with the reversal of the gastric bypass. It seems to us, however, that should her symptoms recur, or her nutrition become inadequate, that there really is little other option. We'd be very grateful if you would watch the following video carefully and comment on any perceived abnormalities. In the video, the bowel is run from the GJ anastomosis to distal to the second JJ anastomosis. In particular, we would value comments on the appearance of both JJ anastomoses it seems that they are abnormally dilated. We'd be very grateful on your opinion as to whether further revision of these may be appropriate, or whether you feel this is an insignificant finding in this patient's case. Just to clarify, proximal JJ anastomosis is simply an anastomosis of two pieces of jejunum now forming the elementary limb. The second anastomosis is between the BP limb and elementary limb forming the common limb. Here is the video. That is the GJ anastomosis with the gastric pouch on the left. Now walk down the elementary limb, which again appears normal.
Now coming into view is the first JJ anastomosis. As mentioned before, this is simply a join between two pieces of jejunum to form the elementary limb. Walk down to the next JJ anastomosis. Discussed, we feel that these anastomoses are quite dilated, or more so than would be expected. I'm very grateful for your views on this point. Many thanks for listening to this presentation. Thank you. Now well yeah, very, very difficult case. I mean, who's going to have a, a clue of, of, for the solution? The only thing is that, that those two anastomoses are, are really abnormally dilated, if I can see. Those are really have become a tonic sex, you know. I mean, that I can assume that there is no passage. It is such a, it's a balloon, seemingly. Are you sure that both parts of the small bar, which you could, could still see, that are isoperistaltic uh, constructed? I mean, that... That medium part, if that would be anisoperistaltic, that could be for sure a major cause, and, and that we could not see on the mesentery. I assume it's not the case, but still, no, it's not the case. Okay, good. But the two anastomoses are, are so wide on itself that, that eventually, I think, dismantling both, I'm, I'm, it's going to be, I think, a, a thing to consider, really, you know, to get away those both sex with, you know, I don't understand why this patient is a depressive patient, but not too many medications, I assume, or... or uh, it's uh, chronic opiate use. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And I wonder if we're missing something here. Mm. These patients that have chronic abdominal pain yeah. are opiate dependent. Yeah. But once you had a real objective problem that you sold out, that's true, uh, but... Yeah, but those yeah. anastomoses, I think they are, you know, 30, 15 centimeters, yeah. that's like a second. I just ask it to, to anybody who's, who's going to be, okay, there's a, a comment. Also, my colleagues there from uh, the other countries, I'm sorry, yeah. It's good, but the bacterial overgrowth is going to be probably not a problem. She's not malnourished. It is really passage. It, it, there is no passage, certainly in the stomach. The stomach, we all know those atonic sacs in the stomach. But even if you look that anastomosis, you know, before that will pass, you know, it suddenly it comes into a non-peristaltic part. I may assume it's only you're going to have two of those that in eating and drinking, and, and she's better now with that, that, oh, it's just temporarily better, because it also goes the same way anyway, that, that's true, I mean, so very strange that they're done better, but two atonic sacs there, we've separated, it's, it's certainly not anatomically well, if you see that anyway, that is true, I mean, there's something not wrong with that, that's true, I mean, it's something wrong, I would say, yeah. I think sometimes we don't have an explanation, Thank you. you know, <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, we, we don't have an explanation, Especially in the patient who has chronic white acid bypass. Yeah. There's so chronic abdominal pain, you have experience of the, all the Swedish and, and 
and, and Norwegian guys, you know, huge experience. And sometimes, you know, the, 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 the cause is not in our stitches. The cause is in the brain of the patient. Yeah, and we have to do a brain transplantation instead of reoperate the patient as many times we can, you know. Oh, yeah, you have to operate on the active. But she had already one has a real complication. Yeah, she had one real, I mean. That. Yeah, yeah, I know. know. So that, that's 100% Of course, you know, you know I was like, they did the knee, yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. But the rest of the symptoms of the patient. But we see a lot of DGs and osteomosis, <coughs> yes, we all are with dilates. But that level of tension is a bit abnormal. It's slightly bit fluid. But okay, back again, I mean, this is assumptions more than, than reality. Yeah. Well, yeah. well we know So there could be an argument to take out the first JJ and osteosis and leave the other one intact. And she still has a rule of mind. She has a mind. My money is on her still piece. So well, the whole question is, still with the still not sure. of 16 or 17 naira. So what we always say to a patient with chronic abdominal pain, some patients are visiting us and they are gaining weight. Then I say, you know, it's objectively nothing. You know, because if you have chronic pain of that intensity, you cannot gain in, in weight. Whatever they say. Then we quickly go to the brain. That's reality. But I don't know what is her weight, but, but if she is not become a kachekic, etc., I mean, then we have to question the objectivity of the complaints of the patient. Gaining weight a bit, I think this is the, the, the plan. Mr. Carr is willing to comment. Mr. Dr. Carr, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Just two things. Really. The reason why I revised the JJ first time round was because on CT scans it looks dilated and atonic and flaccid. So, if you like, the, first, the reason for revising it in the first place was the same problem we're seeing now. And the second thing was to been fully tested and empirically treated for small bowel bacterial overgrowth and had no benefits for her. So ultimately, I think I'm at a loss to know what to do with her. Um, I still think there's a problem with the JJ, JJ anastomosis, but I don't really know a way around it at the moment. So um, we'll keep you posted. Are you doing that double staple, the GG? No, no, not that. No, these were a single staple, hand sewn closure of the hole. Sometimes there are double GGs, you know, the 11, 12 centimeters, but no reason yeah. whatsoever to make such a wide amount of the most. Yeah. Thank you. There's just one last final question. Yeah. No, I just wanted to share with Dorothy as well. We've had uh, one not too dissimilar case in our hospital in Shrewsbury, where again the JHS was quite, I mean, but not as much as your case. Uh, we did the CT scan with our contrast confirmed the diagnosis, we took the patient to theater, we were passionate, we were really proud and happy. Uh, patient went home, still got the same pain. The second time we did the CT scan, the CT scan was perfect, there was no dilation <coughs> this time. We really felt like we treated the CT. Yeah. So I'm just wondering whether sometimes it's just... Uh, uh, that, I think you, your comment is probably the right one, you know, because uh, for those who could not hear, there was a colleague who was mentioning with the same problem in, in, uh, in uh, the same situation where he did the verbal resection of that dilated GG and then there was no, no better outcome on that part. So, I mean, we go back to the, probably the psychiatric situation. Thank you anyway. Let's proceed then. We probably will have one further case because it's going to be late and then the rest. Uh, <coughs> Donald is there. Dr. Donald van der Vrale, also one of my ex-fellows who has now a uh, good practice in Aals, the city close to Brussels, and who's now joining us in Bruges. Donald, it's up to you. That's a diagnostic one, I think, as well. Pre Preoperative one, yeah. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am Donald van der Rep from the ISZ Hospital in Aals, Belgium. It is again a great honor to present a case for a periodic session and also for the London International Aerotic Surgery Symposium. It is a preoperative case regarding weight. 
Our patient is a 39-year-old female patient who has a laparoscopic appendectomy in her history. And also in 2002, a laparoscopic biliopancreatic diversion with con concurrent cholecystectomy. Intraoperatively, however, a left subcostal incision was needed because of an unclear reason. We tried to recover the operation report from the other hospital, but didn't, weren't able to retrieve the uh, operation report. At that moment, the patient was weighing 127 kilograms, resulting in a BMI of 49. Two years postoperatively, she reached her lowest weight of 57 kilograms, uh, reaching a BMI of 22. In 2018, she had a laparoscopic exploration for a suspected internal hernia. At the CT scan, mm -hmm. there was a twisting of the atroatrostomy and a whirlpool sign, so a internal hernia was suspected. However, intraoperatively, a twisting at the atroatrostomy site was diagnosed, but no internal hernia was evaluated. When Evaluating the enterostomy, there was a malalignment of this anastomosis, creating a kinking. So a formal reset of the anastomosis was performed, and a new anastomosis adequately aligned was performed. The patient had a common channel of about 150 centimeter. We tried evaluating the upper abdomen, but due to extensive adhesions and the problem not occurring in the upper abdomen, no further dissection was performed. The patient at the moment has a normal nutritional state with some multivitamins and also zinc supplementation. Currently, she's consulting our service because of weight regain. At the moment, she has a weight of about 100 kilograms, uh, meaning a weight regain of more than 40 kgs, and this is resulting in a BMI of 38.6. For if, uh, with a dietary anamnesis, the patient is mentioning some alcohol abuse in the uh, last five years, also with psychological issues and sweating LS restriction. Since February of last year, there is a complete stop of alcohol abuse. She was counseled by our psychological team and our dietitians since February 2019. Uh, she has only lost a few kilograms with um, decreasing her sweet intake um, and also for our psychological team and our dietitians she is uh, considered as a very motivated patient with a psychological stable status. In our labs we only see vitamin D and zinc deficiency. Vitamin D was suppleted uh, a little bit uh, additionally before uh, considering redo surgery. We also performed a CT scan and upper GI series. The images will follow in, in, in a second. Endoscopy showed a no marginal ulceration, no signs of gastroesophageal reflux disease, and a possible sleeve construction <laughs> with stomosis. although no pyloris is mentioned in the endoscopy report. This is the CT scan. As you can see, there is quite a big remnant stomach filled with dye. <coughs> Line and a possible anastomosis at this side. The duodenum, as we can see, is not filling. is excluded. These are transverse images where you can see an enlarged stomach remnant. And an enteroenterostomy distally. In my opinion, I don't think we can consider this as a sleeve resection, but more likely a formal BBD construction with atrectomy.
These are the upper GIs images. On the left hand side, you can evaluate uh, also a large run in stomach. No pylorus, in my opinion. Subsequent help of the elementary day. of the upper GI series, oblique, we can see a small hernia, the upper images that don't give an adequate evaluation of the size of the pouch. So what can we offer our patients or do we need any additional examination? First of all, do we offer any surgery? The patient is showing very motivated uh, intentions and has state of alcohol for at least one and a year and a half. She also has diminished or sweating. Um, we can add, do some additional restrictive procedures such as banding or resleeving or possibly something else such as a lengthening of the iliopancreatic limb or do we choose for non-surgical treatments with a multidisciplinary approach and possible medication or for endoscopic management with a possible application of the gastroenterostomy Again, 
think about range of translation. Before that, use all the mitigation you have on hand. You better measure a participation camp to, to, to our office say, so the third is again, you know, again capital gives us a Yeah, to today about the We have to say as far for that case, if, if somebody has a comment on that, because it's interesting, the, the failed BPDs are, are rare, but they happen. Yeah. You certainly have to exclude, because you could have the combination of serious malnutrition and still weight gain. And certainly, you know, Antonio knows that some are becoming gracious and they eat more than 4,000 kilocalories a day. And so, you know, they still see weight gain and still are malnourished. Okay. Now, we, we did quite a lot of series, you know, where we did that gastrogenital sleeve, certainly when the understomol is a little bit on side weight. You could do a nice, proper gastrogenital sleeve, but you have to be careful, as we mentioned as well, that they are certainly not malnourished on the BPD. Then you've got to worsen the situation. But the way was that we achieved in doing that was quite acceptable. You more or less go back to the, the, the guys to bypass the situation, but you leave that 50 centimeters there of common environment. This it's such it's just more dangerous for sure. Yeah, but Donald yeah. and, and, and Isabel and Barbie, you know as well, we did quite a lot of those revision of BPD because Dr. Van Otto in our hospital did a lot of scopinars that have been trained. And even you know the, 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 the uh, you know coming also that when he performs, you know, the revision of side. Yeah. They couldn't go yeah. you know, upwards. Mm -hmm. But in four, yeah, you know, yeah. when yeah. they do you know, the, 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 the additional salary, yeah. they couldn't go up. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. if they couldn't, yeah. Yeah. this guy is a very tough target. Yeah, that's right. They're going to do a lot of job very cautious in terms of yeah. uh, go, go again there, back again, going to be, who knows. So they, they, they hear, if you look for the, the surgical solutions, if they would go, it's indeed the re-sleeve. Now, now, in fact, it's not re-sleeve, it is sleeve, because in the BPD there's never been a sleeve, eh? but it, it's in the DS. But anyway, the, the uh, banding adjustable, there are some reports, not fantastic. And you see uh, quite a lot of persons of the surgeons are opting for a non-surgical treatment. And so medication for that purpose indeed could be one of the best. I think it's now six o'clock. I if, if I'm so sorry for the, my best friends of from Dubai, but they are my best friends. They will understand. Can we go to, to uh, Dubai, Doctor Z? We're gonna cancel yours. You don't have to be disappointed because everybody you know we had a big tough session here. We're gonna uh, cancel that. We're gonna postpone it to to January, and you're gonna be the first then, Doctor Farah. Is that okay? Not be angry, huh? <laughs> no, okay, you can. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the business.